Good day. I'm John Fernandez. Welcome to a special edition of eNewsline Live from AACSB's World Headquarters in Tampa, Florida. In 1916, AACSB International was created with the ultimate objective to advance management education worldwide through accreditation, thought leadership, and value-added services. Since awarding the first accreditation in 1917, AACSB International has grown to represent more than 1,300 members in 81 countries. Presently, over 650 of our members, representing 45 countries, hold AACSB accreditation. One of AACSB's strengths has been making sure that its accreditation initiatives are in the hands of a knowledgeable leader. Therefore, we're very pleased when Robert D. Reed uh, accepted his position as Chief Accreditation Officer in the summer of 2012. Today we have the pleasure of speaking with Bob and learning more about his experiences transitioning from Dean of the College of Business at James Madison University to his current role, as well as his insights on various AACSB initiatives and accreditation. We have also had a number of AACSB members submit questions that they would like for Bob to answer. We're delighted to have this opportunity to hear Bob's story and his vision for AACSB accreditation. Bob, welcome to ENL. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Great. Well, we'll go, as usual, we'll go right into the question. Uh, Bob, uh, just as a start, uh, tell us a bit of your background and how it led you to management education and your early uh, encounters, experiences with AACSB. Okay. My, uh, my work experience background is really in the hospitality and tourism business. So I spent a good bit of time in the, in the restaurant field and the hotel field. And my, my connection into management education really occurred when I was in graduate school and was asked to teach a couple of classes as well as support other faculty. So that was really what caused me to pursue a career in, in higher education and management education. Um, I do remember my very first AACSB experience. I was a very young department head um, in the mid to late 80s and, and uh, went to a, an accreditation seminar uh, at the time, uh, knowing very little about accreditation, um, but that was the start of what has become a, a multi-decade journey of uh, learning more about AACSB. I didn't recall your background in, in restaurant management, but believe me, you've come to the right place. We know how to eat at AACSB. You absolutely do. <laughs> okay, how was your experience as dean at uh, the College of Business at James Madison University shaped by involvement with AACSB? I think initially it was shaped by involvement in conferences, seminars, and that sort of activity. It then expanded a good bit into what I would call um, involvement on peer review teams, ultimately on committees, and, uh, and then a lot of networking with other deans and learning about um, how different schools approach different issues, different problems, um, how they address those issues. And, and I don't think I've ever been on a peer review team that I didn't come back to my own campus with a little bit different insight, a little bit different appreciation for how a school approached a particular situation and their responses to dealing with challenges. So in that sense, I think um, being a, a peer review team member, being on committees, uh, being a volunteer on the AACSB side um, really helped me be a better dean because uh, it helped me see um, situations far beyond my, my own campus. Sure, you, you get as good as you give, I think, in that's AACSB exactly. accreditation, and, and that's why we have such a loyal uh, army of volunteers worldwide. They do a great job, and we we'll take this opportunity to, uh, to thank them for their service. Uh, you have volunteered your time to AACSB for many years and served uh, in many roles as a mentor on committees and on peer review teams. Uh, now that you are the chief accreditation officer, uh, what are some of the insights you've gained in transitioning full-time to AACSB? Um, I would say before I transitioned to AACSB as, as a staff member, as Chief Accreditation Officer, I, I knew the accreditation staff, I knew the capabilities of that organization, that set of people. I didn't fully appreciate the breadth and depth of the, of the capacity in the rest of the organization. I don't think in, unless you're deeply involved day to day, you really understand just how much capacity there is in the seminar area, in the communications area, in, in the other parts of AACSB, that as a dean you see from time to time, but you don't see on a day-in and day-out basis. So I think the biggest learning for me has been 
the breadth of capacity and the breadth of services. And then the other, the other piece that I didn't fully appreciate or understand was really the nature of the globalization. And for example, the expansion and the opening of a Singapore office, I've had a chance to visit that office, meet with the staff, understand you know, their challenges, their issues as they try to take the AACS brand into um, a different part of the world and certainly in a different way than we would do um, sitting here in Tampa. I think the greatest challenge is to go from one of the serve to being the server. Uh, it's an exercise in humility, uh, I think in, in conscience, uh, and in the long run, uh, perseverance. So uh, I wish you the best. You're doing a great job. Thank you. I, I, would, start. I would agree with that as I've worked with members of the Blue Ribbon Committee. Um, in many cases, these were people I had served with as fellow deans and, and been peers to. And, and now very much in a role of supporting the work that they do and listening to their feedback and then turning uh, documents around, turning things around, and very much as helping them do the job they're trying to do. From your perspective, uh, what do you regard as being the primary value uh, of accreditation? I think the primary value is very much around benchmarking your school against really fine business schools globally. So you get that external third-party validation. You get a peer set of, of uh, reviewers that come in and look at your school and help you uh, determine if you, if you are an accreditable school and, and worthy of the quality. I think beyond that, though, I think it's the, it's the advice you get from that peer review team, particularly in the maintenance process. Um, you have that consultative review where you can talk about and get some good feedback on the issues and challenges you are facing as a business school. Um, so I, I would say the external validation, um, the cons consultative aspect of the review, and then finally I'd say the benchmarking. As you begin to look at your business school vis-a-vis -vis other business schools that are either peer schools or aspirant schools, you can very quantitatively look at how you measure up uh, where you think you're stronger, where you think you're weaker, what the gaps might be, and then ultimately how as a dean or how as a school you would close those gaps or, or address those issues. With AACSB and our global network, you've got a friend everywhere, and I think that's an important uh, attribute that you've Absolutely. pointed out to, to being accredited by AACSB. Uh, former Chief Accreditation Officer of AACSB, Jerry Trapnell. Jerry, thank you for your service. Uh, place globalization of AACSB accreditation as one of his, uh, probably his top priority. Uh, under your leadership, will AACSB continue to pursue globalization aggressively? Uh, if so, uh, what do you think needs to be done to advance AACSB accreditation worldwide? I mean, very clearly, we are and need to continue to be and need to be better at being a global organization. If we want to work with the best business schools in the world, then we need to have a footprint that is on all continents and in all good, all places on, on the earth. Along those same lines, I think that we need to build um, our volunteer capacity globally. Uh, we have historically been a bit U.S. and North American centric, and so it's important that we build um, the volunteer network globally, that we can deploy peer review teams that have representation from um, that part of the, of the world as the team goes out. I think it's also important that we um, globalize our operations. We clearly have an office in Singapore. Um, we may ultimately have offices in other locations. And so it's a matter of how do, you, how do you deploy the right kind of volunteers and the right kind of staff, and at the same time, how do you integrate those staff so that they speak as, as one voice and represent one organization that's deployed uh, across multiple continents. So clearly globalization um, has to be part of our strategy, um, very much is a part of our strategy, and I think we're doing um, a good job at it. Obviously, things we can do, do better, um, but it's very much a part of what we need to do going forward. Yeah, there, there's a hybrid volunteer staff uh, member that I'm not sure everyone's aware of, and they're called uh, special advisors to the president for different areas, and, and, and now we have three. Uh, your predecessor, Jerry mm -hmm. Trapnell, a special advisor uh, in charge of accounting accreditation. We also have a special advisor to Europe, uh, Terry Grange mm -hmm. uh, of, of Grenoble Accolda Management, and a special advisor for the Middle East and Africa, George Nashar, at the Lebanese uh, American University. So my question is, 
Uh, how do you see the special advisors as being complementary uh, to the volunteer uh, and, and uh, full-time staff uh, efforts in AECSB's globalization? All, all three of the special advisors have a, a deep expertise, uh, not only in disciplines, but also in geographies. And I think that they can help us in ways that um, peer review teams and, and volunteers in those localities can't. Um, they know the landscape, they know uh, the geography, they know the schools, and they can be very helpful in terms of helping us figure out you know, how do we expand our efforts in various parts of the world? How do we expand our efforts in accounting accreditation, for example, with what Jerry is doing? So they have deep expertise. They have longstanding experience and expertise that we can draw upon and, and, um, and by doing so help us become a stronger organization. So the, the role of the special advisor is an important one, and I think their expertise is, is critical at this juncture for us. I, I think I agree. I, I also want to express my thanks to Stephen Watson, who is our longtime special advisor for Europe, who continues to be uh, an integral part, rather, uh, on a more ad hoc basis of AACSB's globalization efforts. Uh, AACSB is emphasizing uh, increased engagement uh, with, with business. What are your thoughts and plans thus far, I know this is early on, in, in enhancing such uh, collaboration? I would say that in the almost 100-year history of AACSB, we've had episodic engagement with business. Uh, at times, I suspect there was a lot, at other times less so. Um, in, again, in the 100-year history, we've never really had an advisory council. Or, or any any sustained engagement with a with a well-defined set of business professionals. If you think about the impact that advisory councils have had on business schools themselves and, and the important role that they have played in the development and improvement of business schools, I think from an industry perspective, AACSB can also benefit from following that path. And so the board has approved and, and we're in the process of implementing uh, the establishment of a business practices advisory council populated by um, some very senior deans as well as some corporate executives um, from across the globe. They can help us look at the management education landscape, but look at it through the perspectives of senior corporate leaders. Um, I think they can play an important role in helping us look at and revise our accreditation standards, our accreditation uh, practices. Um, I'm hoping that we can get some of them involved in accreditation reviews and accreditation committees so that as, as we look at how do we help business schools improve, we're listening to a very important voice, and that's the voice of companies and employers that hire ultimately a lot of the graduates produced by our accredited schools. Um, it's a voice that's important to hear. It's a voice that has at times been, been absent, and I think it's important for us to bring them fully into the process and fully engage them in um, not only the accreditation part of AACSB, but the organization more broadly. Yes, yeah, certainly agree. Uh, I've had a nearly 13-year uh, episodic engagement with, uh, with AACSB as, as a business person, and, and I think business people will find it mutually rewarding uh, to understand and contribute to management education. And I, I have to echo, the presence of, of a business practitioner uh, on a peer review team is a significant advantage. And, and I encourage schools to, to nominate individuals that can serve in that capacity. It's very, very helpful to the school and helpful for uh, AACSB accreditation. You've also been involved with the Committee on Issues in Management Education, one of the board's standing committees uh, referred to as CIMI, uh, which serves as kind of a think tank that identifies, investigates, and researches emerging issues and challenges in management education on a global basis. How has the connection with this timely uh, CIMI initiative uh, influenced and benefited accreditation practices and the organization as a whole, or, or may benefit it uh, going uh, forward? One of the benefits, I think, of CIMI is, is really the whole notion of being thought leaders and looking at important issues. Um, as the Blue Ribbon Committee has, has engaged in their work of looking at and revising um, standards over the last uh, 18 to 24 months. I mean, they, they have drawn heavily on the work that CIMI has done. I think initially they looked at um, the online education environment and some of the thinking that had come out of 
out of SIMI. They clearly have looked at faculty uh, deployment models. And so the work that SIMI has done and the research they've done and the, and the thoughts and, and thought leadership that they've advanced has been very, very helpful um, to the Blue Ribbon Committee as we've um, talked about standards and talked about where the standards should go. Um, if we were to initiate that research on our own as a Blue Ribbon Committee, the process would have been much longer and, and much less efficient. So in essence, we've used the kind of thought leadership that already exists and, and the thinking that's already gone into some of these issues to help inform how the standards should change, how we should perhaps look at issues differently. And I think uh, there's been a very nice synergy between the work that the SIMI has done and then the work of the Blue Ribbon Committee in revising and looking at the standards of the organization. SIMI has been one of the very few committees that from inception has had a, uh, a balance, maybe not an even balance, uh, of practitioners and academics. And I think it's helped the vitality of the committee. Uh, I'd point out that SIMI reports are available on our, on our website uh, as part of our resource centers. Uh, and also, I would take a look at the gfme.org, uh, which has produced two uh, important reports uh, that have been published. It's a little bit of a, of a brother or sister to SIMI. Uh, it's a joint initiative of AACSB and the European Foundation for Management Development. But between SIMI's work uh, on the AACSB Resource Center and uh, gfme.org, uh, their reports, I think they've contributed significantly to uh, establishing a vision or understanding where management education is going and what role we might all have in making uh, for a better management education world and being ready for challenges that are emerging. There certainly are challenges emerging for this, for this industry. With new accreditation standards in the final stages of development, uh, in your opinion, and, and I understand this is, this is a, driven by the Blue Ribbon Committee, it's a, it's a volunteer effort, uh, but what are the main changes that members can expect in standards and processes from your vantage point? Um, I would describe the standards as uh, more focused, um, tighter, cleaner, and more flexible. Uh, I think if you look at the draft standards that are out now uh, under discussion and, and about which we're soliciting feedback, uh, the number of standards has been reduced from 21 to 15. Uh, they're much more focused on the important issues. There will be an important role, a more important role, for peer review teams to exercise judgment. Um, because the standards, I think, are less prescriptive and, and less quantitatively driven um, than the current standards are. And I think we've also tried to theme them around the, the areas of, of innovation, impact, and engagement um, in trying to foster and, and, and build more innovation into business school operation, into the curriculum, looking at the impact the business school is making um, in their own communities with their own stakeholders and in the kind of research that faculty do. And then finally, really trying to foster and promote more engagement. Um, engagement between faculty and students, engagement with the industry professionals that will ultimately hire and work with these students. And so the themes of innovation, impact, and engagement have critically driven the development of the standards um, which are out for review. I, I do think they're tighter. I think they're more focused, and I think they're more flexible um, for schools to to uh, to be able to do what they want to do, execute against their mission, and not have AACSB be a particularly prescriptive uh, accreditation set of standards. Well, I think they've, the committee's done a great job. It's a less is more situation. Uh, we've reduced from over 80 pages down to about 49 pages of standards and guidance. We've gone from 21 to 15 standards, and we've expanded the coverage, so I think they've done an excellent work. One of the components of engagement that you mentioned that I'm very excited about is the encouragement of schools to, be, to pursue executive education more, uh, uh, more aggressively. Uh, I think the standards are, are certainly flexible, uh, and the, the application of the review process is more on the, on the user satisfaction end. It's not so focused on the input end. Um, but what I think is important is going forward, uh, really lifelong learning has come to the point of not just being a buzzword, but, but being a, a real demand of society that managers beyond their MBA program of, of very limited duration continue uh, to develop. 
I also think it's an opportunity for schools on the financial end. Uh, we've, our research has noted that uh, Europe uh, and um, uh, in Asia, about 12% of their budgets come from uh, executive education, while in the United States, it's barely 3%. And in the Middle East and North Africa, it's less than 1%. So I don't want to present executive education as purely revenue driven, but I think the, the collaborative uh, value of providing continuing lifelong learning is that it can help schools increase their revenue base at a time where subsidies are dropping significantly uh, from both public sources uh, and uh, stabilizing of endowments in some parts of the world even absent. So uh, I, I wanna commend the Blue Ribbon Committee on accreditation quality. Uh, I think we've still got more to hear from them and perhaps at a later time we'll hear from uh, the chairship. But thank you for your comments related to their work. Well, the final uh, prepared question uh, I'd like to ask you is, what do you consider the most important uh, goals and objectives for AACSB International to achieve in the next decade or so? And I mean broadly speaking, uh, not just our, our main uh, area of emphasis accreditation. Sure. I, I think probably the, the two biggest areas I think are on the forefront for us are the truly globalizing the organization and, and our, our worldwide reach, uh, not just from an accreditation standpoint, but, but from an operational standpoint as well, uh, with people deployed in various parts of the world. The other thing that I think is very high on our list of priorities is to build and nurture and sustain a volunteer network that is global. Uh, we have the beginning parts of that in, in many places around the world today, but it's not fully developed, it's not fully deployed, and we still at times are too dependent on peer review teams that are made up of people from North America. Uh, that is changing, changing slowly, needs to change more rapidly. So I would say truly globalizing the operation and then building and sustaining a volunteer network that is also global, that then matches the deployment of of uh, accredited schools globally. I think that's a noble objective and what I would say is going to uh, the next level uh, in AACSB's globalization. We, we still have a lot of work to do. Well, now let's turn to our audience and see what they have to ask. Uh, for their first question, what are some of the main challenges that you have observed schools face with with AACSB accreditation? I, I, I assume that's both, uh, or, or separately, in initial accreditation and then in maintenance, uh, or maybe they're, they're the same. Um, I think in many cases they are the same. Um, I don't think there's a definite distinction between initial and, and maintenance of accreditation. I, I think probably the ones that, the issues that I see deans and schools struggle with the most um, tend to be about resources and mission alignment. I think sometimes you see schools that have um, very ambitious missions, and yet they don't have the resources uh, really to execute against that mission. I think that the follow-on from the financial crisis and, and the serious economic conditions that we've all faced in, in virtually every part of the world have caused even a, a more difficult situation for some schools in terms of executing against their mission vis-a-vis -vis the resources they have. Um, I think another area that's of, of serious concern for schools is the ability to attract and retain talented faculty. Um, today, the faculty markets are global markets. They are not um, country markets or regional markets. They are global markets. And so attracting and retaining high quality faculty is a, is a significant challenge for a lot of schools. Um, on a lesser note, I think um, issues like assurance of learning have caused some schools um, some issues, and I think I think we as a as a as an industry have made a lot of progress in ten years, but there's still some some places, and then um, probably more on the initial accreditation side is the the nature or the ability of the school to build and sustain a research culture. Um, we see schools that come into the accreditation process that have executed very successfully in delivering education but not necessarily in building the research capacity, the faculty, and the faculty's ability to do high quality research. So oftentimes there's that nature of building a research culture, sustaining that culture. I'd say those are the four areas that I think schools um, have at times the most challenges with, with, with probably resources and faculty recruitment and, re and retention being the two biggest issues. Well, I hope that, uh, that we can 
uh, assist uh, in building the research uh, culture outlets uh, worldwide, spreading them uh, more evenly uh, throughout the world. Uh, I think we have a role to, to play in that. So it's a, certainly a, a, an aspiration for us. The next point is starts with some deans participate in numerous mentor and PRT visits uh, each year. Uh, and we know this, while others rarely, if ever, are asked to assume volunteer roles. Uh, while this may be the result of schools nominating individuals and, and uh, those who are well known uh, get more assignments, the rich get richer, uh, the perception is that friends are the ones serving on PRTs. Um, what is AACSB's response to this? Uh, uh, of course, I question several of the premises here, but uh, we don't edit the question. So, Bob, what is your response to this provocative uh, point? Well, we have a, a, a very strong and I think very appropriate conflict of interest policy. So, so the notion of, of truly friends doing peer review visits is not necessarily an accurate statement. Um, having said that, um, schools do nominate who they who they would like to see on their peer review teams, and and we go through a rather long process of of assigning those teams, um, and and I think try to truly assign people to teams that that are either from a peer school or an aspirant school, and so that's a, a very long and and at times challenging process to assemble the right kind of teams. However, it's also tied to something we talked about a few minutes ago, and that's the. The, the need for us to develop and sustain a global network of volunteers. Uh, we clearly have a larger number of volunteers who are based in, in North America, to a lesser extent in Europe, and to a lesser extent still in, in Asia. And so as we begin to um, do accreditation visits in more places, um, and we do maintenance visits in, in different geographies, it's going to be very important for us to deploy teams who represent those areas or those regions. Um, and, and that will require us to greatly broaden our number of volunteers. Uh, it's going to be incredibly important for us to train and make sure we send teams out that are fully prepared to do the job we're asking them to do, that they're completely knowledgeable of standards and they understand the culture and context and mission of the school they're about to, uh, to visit, either as a mentor or as a peer review team member. So it is something we spend a lot of time thinking about. And uh, it is something that we do intend to um, devote some time and energy and training to over the next several years. Uh, we, we have one, I think, built-in uh, challenge that, that wasn't noted in the question, and that's that the average dean's term is under five years. It's, it's getting longer. It's, at least it's above uh, four now. And in many parts of the world, it's two or, or something very short. Um, AACSB and I think your experience as a dean, uh, the knowledge of standards, uh, all come together uh, as strengths in being a good peer reviewer. And, and part of that is longevity. So I'd, I'd ask those uh, that are getting out of the seat to, to try and stay longer. I'd ask certain parts of the world, particularly in Asia, to think about having longer serving deans, uh, to making it a more uh, a longer duration uh, effort and I think that it'll, it'll help build the influence of that region in the future of management education. There's too much turnover in deans in certain parts of the world, and, uh, and I think that needs to be addressed. So I've been on my soapbox. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, what is the geographic breakdown, generally speaking, of schools entering the accreditation process over the past several years? Uh, we currently have uh, just under 200 schools that are in process from having either just submitted an eligibility application to being scheduled for uh, their initial peer review uh, team visit. So they're roughly 200, maybe slightly less than 200. Um, of that number, probably 75% are outside of North America, um, very large representation from Asia. And uh, again, I think that's correlated with um, the opening of a Singapore office three years ago and, and the growth of, of um, business education and, and the desire to seek accreditation from that region of the world. Um, we are beginning to explore and, and get inquiries from, from places that we simply haven't been before. And, and um, 
Uh, most of that growth is going to come from outside the United States or certainly from the international arena. Again, special advisor in the Middle East and in Africa will probably lead to growth there as well. So not to suggest that there isn't growth in North America, but it's certainly going to grow at a much smaller rate um, than the rest of the world is going to grow. That's right. I, I think an important statistic is AACSB accredits just over 30 percent of the business schools in, in North America and um, the rest of the world, it's only about 1.3 percent. So there, there's a lot of room for, for balancing uh, over the next uh, 10, 20, 30, uh, even 50 uh, years or more. Uh, with the proliferation of online learning in recent years, uh, and I think expected future, what is AACSB doing to ensure quality carries over to these types of programs? I think the work of the Blue Ribbon Committee is an important um, thing to discuss here because when, when that group first started meeting and started talking about standards, changes in standards, uh, I think the thinking at the time was that there would be a separate standard or set of standards to deal with online education as opposed to other forms of delivery. Um, I think the work that, uh, that CIMI did and the further deliberations of the Blue Ribbon Committee very clearly said we're concerned about quality, we're concerned about quality control, we're concerned about quality delivery and quality enhancement of all programs, all locations, all delivery modes. And so what one might do for an online delivery is really very similar to what one should do for a traditional face-to-face -face classroom experience or a hybrid sort of situation. We're interested in how a school prepares faculty to deliver in that modality, um, how they ensure that the student gets a quality experience with a quality faculty member. And so to have a set of standards or a standard that deals exclusively with online um, really seemed counter to what the Blue Ribbon Committee wanted to do. They were interested in how do we ensure quality irregardless of the delivery mode. I think that's a good principle uh, high quality students engaged with a high quality faculty member and with each other are fundamental tenets that ought to be observed in any mode of, of delivery. Uh, AACSB was at one point uh, discussing a second accreditation product, but that did not happen. Well, that did not happen then. Uh, what other products and services is AACSB considering to help advance management education? Uh, we've been exploring uh, a number of products or a number of services under what I would call an umbrella term of uh, AACSB's consulting and evaluation services or something we internally are calling ACES. Um, currently, there's a couple of products or services that are under discussion. Uh, we have done some pilot work with both of them. Um, one is a product called Compass, which is really focused on what I would describe as a strategic and op operational review of a school. Um, it is done by staff with support from volunteers and, and accreditation committees. We've done a couple of pilots in this area, and I think schools have found it to be helpful in terms of looking at um, not so much should I or could I be an accredited school, but how can I enhance the quality of my business school? And, uh, and so we've done a couple pilots there. Um, the second service really is a more in-depth or more focused consulting service where a school has a particular issue or a particular topic or particular area that they would like some help with, we then um, can assemble a team of either deans or associate deans or in some cases faculty, which we then deploy to the school in really much, very much a consulting engagement. Um, we've again done a couple of pilots in that, in that arena. Um, schools have indicated that they thought it was useful, valuable. Um, I think we will continue to explore how can we improve management education globally? What kinds of products and services might we offer um, in addition to accreditation um, that help schools improve their operations and the, and the delivery of their educational services? Right. Well, having been around, as, as you know, during the time in which we uh, pulled further development of the second accreditation, I, I think it's important to look at the, the time frame. Um, we were beginning the work of the Blue Ribbon Committee on Accreditation Quality, and the membership, particularly in the U.S. and certain uh, sectors, uh, was concerned about this, this potential confusion. 
Uh, and we agreed that maybe the timing was such that we needed to let the Blue Ribbon Committee complete its work. The Blue Ribbon Committee is completing its work and we will have new standards voted on in April. But I don't think the need is going away for a second uh, accreditation that is less sensitive to the need of academically qualified faculty inputs, but still provides quality management education. In most of the developing world, there is an absence of these faculty members. To be truly global, AACSB will very soon have to have a model that embraces developing areas of the world that don't have the traditional academic faculty. So we'll have to, we'll have to work on that, but let's get the Blue Ribbon Committee work done first and, and new standards. Going forward, do you see more engagement uh, with other specialized and or regional uh, accrediting bodies, uh, both within the U.S. and internationally? Um, I, we very much do. Um, I think we would be receptive to um, at least discussions, potential collaborations with any number of other accreditors. Um, you hear schools from time to time that talk about the various accreditation processes they go through kind of reporting expectations uh, they have, and, and they sometimes uh, talk about a phenomenon called accreditation fatigue um, in terms of meeting the, the needs or, or the expectations of various accrediting um, agencies or bodies. And so I think we very much would, would welcome the, the communication, the cooperation, and collaboration. I think that we need to do it under the context of we need to each make sure we we do what we're supposed to do and that we do the due diligence we're supposed to do and that we do and have uh, a quality control process in place. If there are ways that we can modify what we do um, that makes the burden on a school less while at the same time meeting the needs of the various accreditation uh, organizations, then I think that's something we, we could explore and perhaps should explore going forward. Yes, that there have to be some synergies. With recent uh, government push on public transparency, I, I, I assume this means in a global context, but certainly within the United States, uh, regarding post-secondary school performance in many countries, do you see AACSB considering a more public release of accreditation review outcomes? And I, I understand this is not the decision of the chief accreditation officer. Uh, but the decision of the board of directors. But your opinion, Bob? Um, my opinion is that, that clearly not only in the United States but globally there is a push for more transparency and more disclosure of accreditation status, student performance, um, indicators of how well a particular school is doing. Um, I think we have to approach this very carefully, very cautiously, because there are times that you could release information that in fact would um, harm the school or, if interpreted incorrectly, would, would not be beneficial to the public. Um, however, there really is a push towards more transparency. It's something we are having discussions about currently. We have had um, at least one, one discussion with the Blue Ribbon Committee about it. Um, we will continue those discussions with the accreditation committees that are, that are ongoing and, and uh, standing committees. And, and we will wrestle with what's the best approach to this, um, where is the appropriate balance between public disclosure and also what is appropriate um, release of information about schools that are either in the accreditation process or are accredited. It is a very delicate balance and, and it is not something about which there's a black and white answer. It's, it's, a, it's something we have to think about very carefully in terms of what we might do, how we might do it, and how we can best um, meet the needs of the public and the request for transparency, but at the same time doing it in a way that is useful and helpful um, to schools as well. So it's, uh, it, the question is very simple. Um, the answer is much more complex. Yes. Well, I understand that this is our final audience question. Leave it to the last person to hit on a very sticky issue. Uh, it has been the experience of some schools that there have been inconsistencies in interpreting the standards and applying criteria that no longer are valid with current AACSB standards. How will AACSB assure that their peer reviewers are fully prepared to evaluate a school 
based on the new standards? We have, uh, we have been engaged in a lot of conversation and a lot of discussion about how we will train um, peer review teams to, to implement new standards. And clearly this is something that um, takes a lot of our time, uh, takes a lot of our focus. One of the challenges of having a completely peer review process is just that. Um, you, you are using volunteers, trained volunteers. Volunteers know the standards and go out and do reviews of other, of other schools. Um, there are human beings involved and it, it will never be a completely perfect process. Um, that's why you have committees, that's why you have further review, that's why you have something we call internally a remand where a recommendation comes into a committee, committee has um, some questions about it, would like some further information about it, they then go back to the team and have some conversation about those issues and the things they would like more information about. It's, it's our internal quality control for um, a peer review recommendation that comes from the field. So clearly training and, and helping people be ready to implement not only the current standards but new standards is incredibly important. Uh, Blue Ribbon Committee has spent a lot of time talking about that. Uh, they will turn that over to the accreditation committees and the accreditation staff. We've already begun to develop what we think will be a series of training activities that we'll implement globally in, in the months following approval of the new standards. Um, the second part of all this is we collect from schools after a peer review visit their feedback about the team. Um, how well the team has performed, um, how well did they know the standards, um, you know, the school's perception of how that visit went. Um, I think we need to be more systematic in how we then feed that information back to the team um, and how we um, use that to mitigate um, either teams or team members who, who perhaps didn't fulfill either our expectations or the school's expectations. And so I think we're going to use that feedback and a more structured approach to develop the very best peer review teams we can and help them go into the field to be uh, as well prepared as they possibly can be to do what is a very difficult job, um, to, to read material and then be on a campus for a limited number of days, get a good assessment of that school and then write a thoughtful and, and well delivered recommendation about a particular school. It's a tough job. And uh, we need to prepare teams well, and we need to deploy teams that are ready to do it well. Yeah. And I think it, at the core of AACSB accreditation is continuous improvement. Uh, and, and I think we have to absorb some risk in the human dimension in that process. Uh, we wouldn't want to reduce the accreditation process to, to a standard checklist, which would be obsolete the day it was printed. So uh, I think we have to, to assume that the process will have some of its challenges, but that we're going in the right direction uh, with the approach that we take. Well, Bob, thank you very much. Uh, you've thank you given very much. some very candid uh, answers to some questions. Uh, I know that the membership uh, wanted to meet you uh, and others, and I believe that you're going to do a great job as Chief Accreditation Officer in helping AACSB, help leading AACSB to the next level, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John, appreciate it. And as usual, uh, thanks to you, our viewing global audience, for joining in this interesting discussion with Bob Reed. Uh, please mark your calendars for the next broadcast of ENL, uh, which is scheduled for February 13th. Happy Valentine's Day. Dean Paul Danis of the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College, uh, home of the world's oldest MBA program will be joining us in a timely discussion on whether the MBA is at risk. And I know Paul's been a long time uh, servant to AACSB as, as a mentor, a peer reviewer, as secretary, uh, treasurer of the board. So I'm looking forward to having Paul back and hearing his uh, pearls of wisdom uh, going forward on, on the industry. Be sure to visit our website for further information on this and previous episodes of VNL. Thank you and have a great day.